uh, can check it out later. Great. So once again, welcome everyone to this Urban Thinkers Campus, uh, which is being organized by Red Dot Foundation, the National Institute for Urban Affairs, the Urban Vision and Project Mumbai. My name is Elsa Marie De Silva, and I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation. We work on gender equality and gender justice. We have a crowd map called Safe City, where we encourage anonymous reporting of sexual and gender-based violence. And we use that data uh, in conjunction with communities, nonprofits, and uh, institutions to work on a safer cities agenda. Do check our website out at safecity.in and also consider looking at our crowd map for information. Uh, we are very pleased to host uh, every year the Urban Thinkers Campus, which is a format under UN Habitat's World Urban Campaign to bring together a um, diverse set of stakeholders to think about uh, the pressing issues of our time and come up with solutions. And this year, the theme of all the Urban Thinkers Campuses around the world is on climate action. Our theme for the two days is climate action for residents by and for uh, women. May I request you to mute yourself if you are not um, speaking so that we don't have any disruption. So welcome everyone uh, again. Uh, yeah, so my name is Elsa Marie De Silva. I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation. And I'd like to introduce our partners. So the National Institute of Urban Affairs was established in 1976 to bridge the gap between research and practice on issues related to urbanization and suggest ways and mechanisms to address urban challenges in the country. And for more than 40 years now, the NIUA has been the vanguard for contributing to and at times building the urban narrative for a fast evolving urban India. The institution has been actively working on bringing forth key areas of concern for urban India in order to build the discourse at various urban scales. And today, um, Swapnil Saxena from NIUA and I will be moderating the sessions. The other two partners are the Urban Vision and Project Mumbai, who will be moderating the sessions tomorrow. Uh, the Urban Vision is a think-do tank that was instituted to inspire excellence in next-generation urbanization. It has been initiated with the core belief that cities offer a remarkable way to create a socially inclusive, environmentally sustainable, and economically vibrant society. The Urban Vision profiles best practices and the finest thinking in the key components of city building, that is urban design, architecture, infrastructure planning, policy strategies, etc. So do join us tomorrow where Pratima Manohar, the founder, will be co-moderating with Shishi Joshi, the founder of Project Mumbai, which is also a non-profit uh, and it works on a model of public-private people partnership engaged in social transformation through initiatives of scale. So just to give you an overview of the agenda, people are still walking in. So do also use this opportunity to introduce yourself and your organization and why you're interested in the Urban Thinkers Campus. But today our um, deep dive is on gender and mobility. And the guiding question that we are going to be discussing through our uh, keynote, impulse givers, the breakout room, and then uh, the entrepreneurial showcase is how might we incorporate gender sensitive planning and responses to increasing women's access to mobility. And uh, we will be capturing all the input suggestions um, and best practices into our report, which will be published on the World Urban Campaign uh, site by UN Habitat. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Sonal Shah. Ms. Sonal Shah is the executive director of the Center of Sustainable and Equitable Cities and the founder of the Urban Catalyst. 
which advises multiple stakeholders, governments, development banks, philanthropic organizations, and think tanks on sustainable, equitable city planning and transport. And over the last 15 years, Sonal has worked across 10 states in India, as well as Asia, Middle East, and the United States, focusing on sustainable urban transport, non-motorized transport, integrated public transport, land use and transport integration, and gender equity. Sonal was responsible for introducing India's first gender-sensitive urban planning guidelines and actively contributed towards revising India's national urban street design guidelines to make, pe make them people-oriented. Welcome, Sonal, and over to you. I'm really curious to hear from you um, your thoughts on this topic. And Sonal's video is uh, a little faulty today, but she... Uh, uh, she'll still be speaking and she'll be sharing her slides. Over to you, Sonal. Thank you so much, Elsa. Um, and thank you to uh, the NIUA, um, Red Dot Foundation, the Urban Vision. My sincere apologies, there is, an, there is a problem with my video, but hopefully I think that may not take away from what I have to say. So what I'm going to do today is lay out some key issues around uh, gendered mobility and then discuss how we might address these. My, my co-panelists will go into further details as I understand. So at this point, I will focus on a, a slightly broader picture. Just want to check if uh, my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So uh, just give me a minute, please. Um, yeah. So very briefly, uh, the Center for Sustainable and Equitable Cities, we call ourselves CSPEC, works um, uh, directly on catalyzing gender, gender inclusive cities and transport systems. Uh, and we situate ourselves in the context of an urbanizing India, where in 2018, close to 34% of our population resides in cities. However, that is expected to grow to around 880 million or more than half, um, more than half of our total population by 2030. And a lot of our infrastructure has yet to be built. But one of the questions that, that many academics themselves have raised is the extent to which cities are able to benefit women in the ways in which they contribute towards the making of the city through their paid remunerative work and their unpaid household and care work. Some of the impacts that we see um, of the access of transport on, on women's livelihoods and economic opportunities, I think this is recognized. Um, one is that the lack of transport reduces women's participation in the workforce by close to 16.5%. We have also discussed this in the context of India. And while there are many, many factors that contribute to this, one of the key issues that we see is that women and girls forego opportunities, work opportunities due to waiting times, unavailability of public transport and the fear of safety, right? This is something we understand as restricted mobility. In a study conducted by the Ola Mobility Institute across 11 cities in India, they, they, they found that only 9% of women felt safe while commuting in public transport or using public spaces. And then there are many reasons for these, including unsafe streets. Um, and while we see a lot of emphasis being made on, on mindsets and, and behavior change, which must happen, there is a point to be made about the way our infrastructure and services cater to women, girls, and gender minorities, right? 
Uh, I think we have also seen multiple articles that talk about how us, our public spaces are not geared towards women and girls' needs. These are just some that talk about not only the lack of good streets, uh, pedestrian infrastructure, street lighting, uh, the, the uh, lack of uh, public toilets, but also thinking that in a context where women predominantly play the role of caregivers, do, do, our, do our public transport systems actually cater to caregivers? And, and the, the goal is not to increase women's care burdens, but to also think about caregiving and infrastructure for caregiving within transportation overall as well. In 2011 and 12, we found that only 0.24% of women were employed in the transport sector. That is increasing, but that is only 1% compared to uh, men who are about at 8%. So 8% of men are in working in the transport sector. And often, the transport sector is considered a space um, uh, not for employment for women. So I think, you know, kind of having outlined some of the broad issues, what is it that we can do? And one of the first things that uh, we can do is think about collecting data. I'll emphasize different kinds of data, but the first one is quantitative data. And a lot of our work around this has aimed to demystify um, what, what, how mobility is gendered. And this is uh, some of the data that I'm presenting from our work in uh, three cities in Bihar. They are small to medium-sized cities. One of the things that we need to do is collect and report data by gender, age, and incomes not only in our comprehensive mobility plans, but also in every project that we undertake. Often, our, our, we focus only on work trips, which to a large extent reduces women's caregiving work, uh, caregiving trips, as well as education trips, right? And, and one of the things that we will observe in the context of Bihar, we found, for example, that when we looked at the overall travel pattern, both of men and women, um, close to 41% of all trips were work for work, 21% were for uh, education, 18% were for household purchases, often disguised as shopping, which might be household purchases. And we had about, and a majority of the household and care work trips were actually performed by women. Um, similarly, what we found uh, across multiple cities, and this is also laid out over here, when we look at the mode of travel, while we observed that close to, you know, close to 40% of trips were by walking, a majority of our pedestrians are women. And I think this is really important to consider that as we design our streets for pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, that women constitute a majority of pedestrians in our cities. Similarly, because paratransit provides flexibility, can cater to shorter trip distances. We also find that a majority of passengers moving by shared paratransit were women. And this is important to consider if we want to think about sustainable cities and sustainable transport. While we are talking about women uh, as a homogenous group, one of the key things that we also need to look at is is intersectionality and particularly in age and income. Now we present some data again from uh, an analysis of data from 11 cities across India that women's stated preference for public transport. Uske alawa have plans to join the Indian Army. 
women's stated preference for public transport rapidly reduced with increase in incomes and their willingness to shift to public transport, their priorities for lower income women was coverage with affordability as the second major aspect followed by frequency, whereas comfort became a key criteria for higher income women. We need to collect and report data to understand women's travel both in the peak and the off peak hours. When we look at the travel and mobility of lower income women in the city of Delhi, what is it that we found? We found that their peak hour trips were made made in the non-peak hour of bus services, such that close to 60% of their peak hour trips were actually being catered by paratransit. So what this is telling us is that in order to improve the mobility of women, we need to consider their safety. We need to understand their daily travel, their trip distances, their modes of travel, and when they are traveling in the day. How And when we consider, for example, quantitative data, we also need to acknowledge the power of qualitative data and tools like safety audits or assessments like we did here, for example, in um, the Bangalore Metro Rail Station, where we walked with a group of trans women to understand the fault lines in our, our transport infrastructure when we only think in gender binaries. Using this data, we need to create gender inclusive standards and either we create them or, and in most cases, we'll have to update our standards. These will be standards and norms for land use and transport integration, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, bus stops and paratransit, amenities, particularly thinking of nursing spaces and public toilets, as well as, pre, as, well as embedding behavior change within our infrastructure. And I'm going to give a very small example of how this can be done. It is insufficient to only look at some aspects. So here is an example of what a bus stop would actually do in order to, to include the perspectives of uh, women, persons with disabilities, senior citizens, caregivers, ensuring visibility so that we don't have dark corners behind our bus stops, creating space for both static, um, uh, creating space for both static information as well as real-time information, and uh, providing a sheltered space to wait for uh, buses as well. The third major aspect that I think we will need to do is build the technical and human resource capacity within our organizations. When we are talking about human resource capacity, that cannot be done only with one gender expert, but at least a team of experts within our organization and that look at one, uh, infrastructure, two, behavior change, and three, policy assessment. Um, policy by policy, I mean uh, human resource and organizational policies, because only then we'll be able to ensure gender mainstreaming within our organizations as well as in our infrastructure and services. I just want to share an example of, of some of the uh, capacity building that we did, where this was a group of uh, the Road Transport Authority female students, paratransit operators at the traffic police and using ways that will allow the personal to become political in the sense that understanding, making users, making, aware, making decision makers aware of what different age, income and ability, people with different abilities experience the city and how they can be left behind if we don't cater to their unique needs is very, very critical. And, and uh, uh, this can be used as a basis for initiating 
building capacity within our own teams. One of the biggest challenges that we are seeing in Indian cities is, and, and this is not only true for Indian cities, but also globally, is that while women may constitute a majority of pedestrians, uh, their ownership of vehicles, be it cycles, two-wheelers, or cars, is, is very, very limited. And, and increasing women's access to cycles, creating safer road infrastructure for cycling, teaching them how to cycle, as well as creating groups to nurture confidence can be some of the ways in which we can increase women's share of cycling because that will increase the boundary of their economic uh, opportunities as well. Building partnerships for implementation, and I'm going to touch very briefly on this, is we have seen some interesting examples. One of the Kochi Metro Rail with the Kudumbashri in Kerala, where they partnered with the Kudumbashri to, to recruit women to maintain all their metro rail stations. And they have around, around 600 plus women as well as 12 transgenders. So where transit authorities can partner with membership-based organizations in order to, in, to in, increase women, um, women's participation in the sector can be really, really critical. Another example is increasing asset ownership amongst lower income women, um, leveraging some of the electric vehicle policies. And I think we have another example of the Self-Employed Women's Association in Delhi that is actively working with um, their members in order to adopt um, uh, and operate electric rickshaws. One of the last, uh, last few things that I would like to say is that Women restrict their mobility to a large extent in the night as well. And while we have acknowledged, and we will need very dedicated, um, uh, dedicated efforts in order to improve or increase women's uh, travel uh, so that they, we can extend the time that they can uh, that they can stay out in the night. There are multiple examples. We do have request to stop services being implemented globally. Uh, we still have to see how they can become a little more effective. Um, in, in Kerala, we are seeing that uh, the, the interstate and intercity uh, bus terminals provide night accommodation um, to women and their dependents under 14 years old. We are looking at, we can look at women led police patrols again being implemented through some uh, to some of the Nibiru fronts. Just on a on a on maybe a last note, that one of the ways in which we can create gender inclusive cities is to first start measuring. We cannot we cannot provide we cannot create gender inclusive cities if we do not begin with measurement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonal, for that very, uh, you know, enlightening presentation. I think there were so many points touched upon and uh, we will be hearing from Kochi Metro, Western Railways, um, you know, Bixi, Taxi, lots of different initiatives that uh, are doing some amazing work uh, across the country. My my question to you is if there's one thing you did mention that we need to start measuring it right but in order to measure it we need to first understand it do you th which it's a chicken and egg situation how do you think we should address it yeah thanks Elsa and I think there are some examples already uh, I didn't get a chance to touch upon them what we are seeing so I'll give you one example which is very practical in the city of Bhubaneswar the, what we have done is that MOBUS, which is the bus agency, has configured its electronic ticketing machines to, to give tickets. And when, they, when a conductor issues a ticket, they will note your, your age, so whether you're a senior citizen or not. They will note your gender so that then that is recorded in the ticket. What they've done 
at the point of sale of a ticket, it allows the public transport authority to understand where women are traveling, right? Where they are boarding, where they are lighting. So that is one example. The second one that I will, I think, and these are low hanging fruits, if you will, are comprehensive mobility plans that are, that are prepared by cities already. They collect household level data. They, they may have to kind of revisit the structure of the surveys, but when they collect household level data, they never report it by gender and by age. They do report it by income. So I think that you know there these things can already be operationalized um, within our existing context. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Lots of food for thought. So thank you so much for your wonderful keynote. And I'm now going to hand it over to Swapnil Saxena, my colleague from NIUA, who will uh, moderate the second part of this uh, event. Sure. Thanks, Elsa, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be co-hosting this with Elsa, and lovely to see so many people tuning in from different parts of the world. Uh, I'm Swapnil Saxena, and I work as uh, a knowledge officer at the National Institute of Urban Affairs in New Delhi. Uh, NIUA, in its uh, continued endeavor towards supporting sustainable and equitable development, is pleased to collaborate with the Red Dot Foundation, the Urban Vision, and Project Mumbai today for this Urban Thinkers Campus. So uh, we are all well aware that there are enough questions and challenges facing not just uh, the city governments, but also citizens. So big questions and challenges such as the climate change, uh, of course, the pandemic, and a potential upcoming economic crisis. So one wonders, uh, specifically, why should we center a discussion around gender and mobility? Sonal's keynote address highlighted through interesting statistics the questions and core problems around women's access to transportation and their strong interlinkages with workforce participation, access to infrastructure and basic services, education, health, as well as their participation in public space. I hope we discuss this and find answers to such questions in, in the uh, upcoming sessions. But in addition to discussing this, this webinar is also a great opportunity for all of us to hear from practitioners in the sector about the innovative work they have undertaken at the intersection of gender and mobility. I'm excited to introduce three great speakers that have agreed and accepted to participate as impulse givers for this event. Ms. Aarti Singh, Ms. Sumi Nadarajan, and Ms. Aswati Dilip. We are honored and privileged to have all three, with, three of you with us today. So uh, a detailed bio of each and every speaker will be available to you in the chat box. Uh, but I would briefly uh, like to introduce Ms. Aarti Singh. Uh, so, uh, you know, in a world where uh, mobility and transportation uh, is, has been a field dominated by men uh, in the planning and decision making sectors, Ms. Aarti Singh is a great example of bringing women's voices into the discussion through her exemplary work in the Mumbai division of the Western Railways. Today, she will reflect on her experience on women's participation in rail transport of India and also discuss some of the many initiatives she undertook on women empowerment in various capacities while being in the service. She holds a PhD in history and is an officer of the Indian Railways Traffic Service. Uh, she joined in the 2006 batch. Uh, she has worked in various capacities in the railways and currently she is the director of administration in the Department of Atomic Energy in Mumbai. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am, and uh, over to you. Before you make your presentation, I would like to highlight to the uh, participants today, uh, please drop in uh, your questions into the chat box uh, while uh, our speakers make their presentations, and we will take all the question and answers after the presentations are done. Uh, over to you, Ms. Aarti Singh. Thank you, Sopnil. Thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. please go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I have not prepared any presentation because I thought I'll just share my experiences uh, during my posting. So uh, first of all, thank you so much NIUA and Red Dot Foundation for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, with such a large, uh, such a large audience. And uh, uh, I am uh, I have uh, worked in jailways for almost fifteen years, and my last posting in Mumbai. Uh, gave me opportunity to work in Mumbai suburban, which is like uh, an institution itself. So it was very enriching experience for me personally and professionally as well. And um, uh, for gender and mobility, I personally feel that both are uh, complementary to each other. Uh, more women using uh, uh, transport services means it will be more progressive and advanced and uh, better transport services will give better opportunities to women. So this, I totally agree with so, what Sonal has said. Means I'm a big fan of Sonal. I must say here that I have read her all the articles and reports and what they are doing is really exceptional and really, really uh, helpful for uh, planners like us and uh, uh, first thing what uh, I want to say what uh, uh, Sonal has also mentioned that the uh, transport sector is highly male dominated and uh, international labor organization also in its uh, policy brief of 2013 mentioned that the jobs in transport sectors are highly gendered and uh, unequal and that is why uh, women's voices are often uh, are often ignored when it comes to transport planning. In Indian railways, what Sonal uh, shown us the percentage of women in transport sector. So in Indian railways, uh, we have 1.2 million of workforce, in which only seven percent are uh, percent are women, and mostly are uh, you know sitting in uh, office jobs and mostly are away from the core job of train operation. And uh, the, for uh, decision-making uh, level, uh, it comes. This percentage comes to around 11 percent. And but uh, they are also like from non-technical side, and very rarely they reach to the apex level where they can, you know, decide the policy or uh, they can make any decisions. So uh, for the outside world, if you all feel that uh, uh, gender sensitivity is not there in transport planning from government side, it is because it is highly male dominated and the system is not uh, sensitive enough and also not aware enough for the needs of uh, you know, human commuters. And uh, in my posting, I tried to address the, uh, this, uh, is these issues from both the sides. From uh, a woman commuter side, we organized many uh, campaigns and workshops, and we, uh, you know, conducted workshop on right to report means how they uh, we reach to women commuters and we make them aware of uh, uh, right way of reporting any sexual harassment case. Then uh, I also tried to publicize the uh, initiatives what uh, what were being taken by by Western Railways. In that way, Western Railway is a bit better situation. We have helpline and, uh, you know, 24 into 7 control room where anyone can report anything. So in that way, but uh, I tried to, you know, more publicize these initiatives to women so that they become aware of the process. And third uh, in, uh, initiative was uh, with the Red Dot Foundation in which safety walks were conducted in, uh, in railway station to find out the uh, vulnerable spots. So this was like uh, approaching women commuters. Then I also tried to, you know, see uh, the situation of my women staff. So uh, we need to increase the women workforce uh, and we need to bring them at the face of the transport sector. So my one attempt was that uh, uh, I tried to send ladies ticket checking staff in long distance trains, because in Mumbai division, we have around 100 uh, such a staff and they all were being posted in a stationary duty. Because it was like typical patriarchal system where male uh, ticket checking staff was going in long distance trains and female were being posted at the stations only. 
so i tried to, I, I tried to change that and i tried to you know give the proposal that they should also go in uh, long distance trains because it has better career opportunities they could work in you know mail express rajdhani trains and they they uh, even get extra financial benefits also if they work in those trains but uh, to my surprise they were uh, the resist they were very much resistance and they uh, didn't want to uh, you know break this th their uh, uh, system whatever was going on so um, i tried to talk to them i tried to understand what was their perspective and it was more because of social stigma and you know family obligations and they have this underconfidence in their own capabilities ki oh, we will not be able to do it we have not done that but uh, then i tried to talk to them i tried to uh, you know uh, address their concerns also we i tried to um, address their logistical issues the rest houses and you know uh, washrooms and safety issue that is what i tried to do from my side and finally we could send them in 2017 to a few staff and then 2018 also so uh, in you know but in all these i found that you know this women empowerment and the increase in workforce is not going to happen naturally because infrastructure is not ready for women staff to go in the field and work that is why they are so much hesitant they are very hesitant to uh, even join the transport sector first it is male dominated the infrastructure is catered for male and they hardly think about that ki in future also any women can come that means they don't even think on that line so that is why very rarely women come and even if they come they don't want to stay they want to go to other jobs comfortable jobs so that is why my uh, you know my uh, argument from the government side is that we need to create the work space like that that more women are joining transport sector more women are joining in railways even the engineers they should at least they should try to come uh, within railways and so that then only we can think about you know bringing a a, a, a constructive change from inside otherwise we can only you know say ki government should do this government should uh, should have done that but uh, there is the, the thing is thinking is totally different means the government is of the opinion that we don't discriminate we don't discriminate so it uh, means we uh, take everyone equal but the system is with is, is only by men for men and uh, women are at the margins they are not at the center they don't want to come to the center because of the Uh, the the system and the sector the kind of setup is there so i totally agree with sonal that we need more women in workforce and uh, i uh, i was the one who uh, organized the gender sensitive sensitivity workshop for my frontline staff also i tried to change the social stigma but it was all all you know personal uh, it was all because i feel for these issues i'm passionate about these issues once i am out of that post now things are like same so uh, i tried to you know then uh, after coming out of that post i tried to pen down my experience and uh, in 2019 i published a study paper on uh, women participation in indian railways and um, uh, just few days back i have also written a policy paper which is yet to publish but uh, i am hoping that it will reach uh, in the proper hands and uh, it some change will come because uh, we definitely need for women from inside also this is like the other end of these issues which needs to be addressed and that is why we need policy input from government and uh, we need incentive we need motivation to you know so that women join the transport sector the railways and that is when we can actually think about uh, gender inclusive planning so that is all i just wanted to say thank you so much for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you so much uh, ms arti singh uh, uh, great insights and uh, lovely to hear some experiential learnings uh, from uh, you know from coming emerging out of your work in the sector 
I think uh, something that really stood out from your presentation was the importance you gave to uh, effective communications and outreach and also to engaging with uh, stakeholders, women being the primary stakeholders of your work. So, uh, I mean, uh, really great insights from that. Um, and uh, we will take questions in the end. Uh, I'll uh, now uh, uh, move on to our next speaker. Uh, so uh, in the conversation around smart cities, the importance of well-connected streets with wide obstacle-free footpaths, safe pedestrian crossings, organized parking, et cetera, are things which are widely discussed today. Um, uh, Aswati's work uh, on uh, who leads the complete street strategy policy and projects work for the Institute of Transportation and Development, it, uh, it basically uh, reflects of the great work she has been doing in uh, not just this sector, but also in uh, you know, various projects under the India Smart Cities mission. Uh, we are glad to have you with us, uh, Aswati. Uh, and uh, Aswati, for, uh, for everybody uh, joining us uh, today, uh, she is a, a senior program manager at ITTP India program, and she works across the national, state, and city uh, levels with governments, uh, providing them technical assistance on sustainable and equitable urban mobility. And as I mentioned, her most exciting work is uh, around transforming congested roads and streets into vibrant uh, public spaces for all users, including men uh, and women, children, etc. So Aswati, uh, I invite you to make your presentation and over to you. Thank you so much, Swapnil. So first of all, thank you for giving me this fantastic opportunity. And it's been um, two very engaging speakers so far. And uh, you know, I'm excited to sort of share um, our insights to the story as well. I'm very sorry for some reason, my slide share is not working. So Tanya is going to help me uh, with that. So I, um, you know, as Papil mentioned, I represent the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. And we work with cities, um, states, and national governments to encourage sustainable, equitable, and inclusive uh, urban transportation and development. Uh, Tanya, can we share the slides, please? Yes. Thank you so much. So yeah, you know, just like um, Sonal had mentioned, when we look at mobilizing our women, it's very important to think about, you know, how is it that they travel? Because their ability to access, whether it is education, whether it is work, whether it's healthcare or any other services that they need, mobility plays a very important role in them deciding whether to take that trip or not. So if you could just move to the next slide. I, I believe that, you know, as you try to look at the solutions that women need, it's very important for us to understand some of the larger questions. And here I might, you know, ask you, do we know how our women are traveling? Have we understood clearly how they feel when they embrace these modes of transportation? How is their travel different from men? As we've worked with city governments in multiple states across the country, I've realized that these questions are not, uh, you know, are, are, while they might seem simple questions, these are questions that most officials or engineers or even, you know, consultants maybe do not have the answer to. And, I, and in that context, I think this is a very important, uh, you know, uh, a, a very important topic to discuss in this particular forum. Moving to the next slide. So looking at how women travel, about our surveys showed that nine out of 10 trips by women are mostly either by foot or public transport. This includes both formal and informal public transport, which clearly means that poor infrastructure for working for public transport has a different burden on men uh, on women as compared to men. So women tend to feel the heat a lot more when there is poor walking and public transport facilities in their cities. Now, moving to the next slide, in our cities, when we did a bunch of surveys to understand 
what is it that women feel while they you know move through the cities and this is where uh, for me you know what sonal repetitively mentioned about measuring so it's also important for us to understand perceptions of women and when we had done our surveys this one particular quote really stayed with me where Maryama, who is a house help who is walking through the cities of chennai streets of chennai she said that in tamil she said na enodu uyir kaiyila pudichiru which clearly means that she is holding her life or her heart in her hand while she walks through the streets of the city now that's her experience and that's not what we want our women to feel uh, moving to the next slide it also you know just like the way sonal had highlighted sexual harassment is another critical concern that actually lurks women at every step which is something that we need to address head on now having understood about some of these the experiences that women feel it's also important for us to understand how is their travel different from men and moving into the next slide i'd like to share that you know while men may uh, travel from one location to the other that is they might actually travel from their home to their workplace mostly during um, peak hours moving into the next slide you will notice that women's travel patterns are quite different they may take their children they may be traveling with elderly they might move into you know they might drop their children at home go to their office come on their way back stop by the market buy you know uh, a few groceries maybe then pick up their children and go back or they might not be working they might take their elderly to the hospital on their way stop by do some groceries and come back so their travel patterns are quite different they do have uh, other passengers or travelers accompanying them and their travel times are also during off peak hours largely now moving into the next slide i think you know the the big question that we are sort of trying to ask is how can we make sure that our women's travel is safe comfortable and convenient and i'm basically using two case studies to share with you the experiences that we had where we probably did well and where we did not and uh, you know share what our learning from these two case studies have been so moving to the next slide one question as we worked in the uh, you know as we worked on projects in uh, chennai uh, it was about how can we make our streets become safe and comfortable for walking now in order for our uh, for it to be a safe and comfortable experience for women to walk one very important thing moving to the next slide you'll notice is that we need to make sure that our blocks are small now we cannot ensure that you know we can it cannot be a case where our blocks are so large where our women have to walk circuitous routes rather than just walk short distances so this is this is a principle that we've been keeping in mind but as you go to the next slide you'll notice that there are sometimes smaller changes that are very essential so here is an example of a street in chennai where you can see the continuous breaks in the footpath in front of property entrances now these are extremely difficult especially if you are a pregnant woman or if you are traveling with many children as you can see on your picture towards the right the same street once the footpath project was completed it became a one footpath with one level and which was continuous and this was a great it, it really improved the comfort of women using this particular street moving to the next um, slide what this is an example of a busy commercial center in um, chennai called pondi bazaar which was just inundated by parking way park vehicles and this clearly you know resonates that thought that maryama had said that traveling or walking on the street is extremely unsafe so when we redesigned the street if you can move to the next slide you'll notice that we made sure that space was reclaimed from parked vehicles and there was space clearly allocated for the frontage zone for people to view the wares which are kept inside the shop clear space for the pedestrian zone where women could now even access the space with their children uh, even if they were on their prams and then there was the furniture zone that was provided going to the next slide in the in the 
uh, street, we now introduce pedestrian lights as well and made sure that even if the trees were there, the street was extremely well lit so that it can, you know, it improves the experience that women feel. And now women feel comfortable staying in the space even later at night. Moving into the next slide. Now, as women travel with different uh, accompanying passengers, sometimes it might be there might be a need to rest and so providing seaters and as you move to the next slide ensuring that there is a well shaded uh, space as well it would make sure that women who are also traveling with their children feel comfortable while they are using these spaces uh, could you please move to the next slide so now um, in this particular, the last project, one of the issues that we heard like after the project was implemented was that there were no toilets that we had incorporated. And this was a big um, you know, uh, a concern that was highlighted by women once the project was completed. And I'd just like to share that with you so that you, know, you can also keep that in mind as y'all are progressing in your own projects. Now here is a, a bit of a different example that I wanted to share with you, which was about a national program that we are running with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. It's called uh, the India Cycles for Change program. And I wanted to share with you how we've, you, through this program, we've looked at how cycling can be made safe and fun for women. So moving into the next slide. So generally, when we were looking at, you know, what, what is it that is required for safe cycling infrastructure, we always think that, you know, you need to have wide cycle tracks, which are, um, you know, sort of protected from fast moving traffic with buffer zone, it has to be shaded, well lit, continuous, etc. Now, in this particular program, if you could just move to the next slide, what we did is that before we started with what is needed for the women in our cities, we had a perception survey that was floated. So we spoke to women, understood what their challenges were when they were cycling. And when the cities were looking at redesigning their streets, we had what we call the handlebar survey. So we got men and women on cycles, cycling on the streets to understand what are the real deal breakers that they are facing. Next slide. And it was interesting to note that while there were infrastructure challenges, some of the big pieces that came out from women was that nine out of 10 women didn't own a cycle. So we could give them the best of infrastructure, but they didn't have the cycle in the first place to cycle. And secondly, four out of 10 women did not know to cycle. So infrastructure is a very important piece, but it's very important to listen to our stakeholders, which are women at this particular point, to understand what are the gaps, other gaps that they are facing as well. Next slide. So multiple cities, what they did was they first also focused on, while they were looking at improving their infrastructure, they focused on access to cycles. How can we look at free cycle programs or cycle rentals or cycle sharing uh, systems? Next slide. They also did programs to teach women to cycle. They had cycle rallies where young girls were uh, also encouraged to be a part of. They did stories of um, freedom to look at how cycling had actually um, sort of liberated women and they wanted that to inspire many more women as well. Next slide. And you know, and to top it all up, it's very important for us to inspire through leadership. Multiple cities had uh, their cit uh, city leaders championing the cause for cycling by taking on to cycle by themselves. Next slide. So before I go into this, like I'd like to reinforce uh, once again that what we heard from Sonal, that it's very important for us to start measuring and maybe start measuring by hearing from our girls and women. So it's very important to have infrastructure that supports women. It's also important for us to understand from women what are the other uh, you know, softer elements that also we require and ensure that both of these come together. Now, last but not the least, I, you know, when I noticed that there were many students who were here, I'd just like to say, how is it that each one of us can support this change? Most often, a room where infrastructure projects are being discussed looks like this. And if you are not on that table as a woman to share what your thoughts are, mostly the infrastructure projects will have 
ideas from all those men who are sitting there. So even if you're a young professional, I would like to encourage each one of you to sit at the table and loudly and clearly raise concerns of women so that we can successfully create solutions which are friendly for women. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aswati. Thank you so much for that really interesting presentation and a lot of good pictures to get the message across. Uh, so your presentation clearly, uh, you know, highlights that you know this is this has to be addressed system uh, systematically and systemically. So there are a lot of interlinkages between the various challenges that you highlighted, and it's it's in a way good to see that the change is happening. Our streets uh, and our cities are transforming. Uh, you know, and you also highlighted, you know, how increased participation of women, uh, not just participation, but also representation, getting them on the table where actual decision making helps is so important. And also, you know, the role of uh, strategic and really involved leadership is a very strong message that came across uh, from your presentation. Uh, we would request you, if possible, please stay for, till the Q&A. It will happen after the third speaker uh, presents. Uh, but thank you so much. Yeah. I would like uh, to now introduce our third speaker, Ms. Sumi Nadaraja, who is the Senior Deputy General Manager at the Kochi Metro Rail Limited. Uh, so a little bit about the Kochi Metro for those who have not uh, read a lot about uh, the wonderful project. Uh, so it is run by an army of women and it is equipped with solar power. It's dedicated and dedicated breastfeeding pods. It is altering the way things happen generally, you know, in uh, projects are implemented generally in cities. Uh, this sensitivity uh, typifies many of the state-owned metro uh, policies in Kerala. And the project that uh, Ms. Nadaraja will discuss today it was an unusual infrastructure project right from its outset, uh, from training and appointing female drivers to hiring 60 transgender women. This is the first time any company in India has formally decided to hire along such lines. I'm pleased to invite you, uh, Ms. Nadaraja, to share your experience from the Kochi Metro implementation. Uh, she basically leads the sustainability initiatives in KMRL. Uh, initiatives like poverty eradication and gender inclusion. And we are very pleased to have you uh, on the panel now. Over to you. Thank you, Sapnal. Actually, it's really an honor to be here today in this platform because I would thank, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please yeah, yeah. So I should uh, thank uh, Red Dot uh, Foundation for inviting me to this uh, platform to share our experience. Uh, on an initiative which has not been taken anywhere in whole of India. So as um, I think Sonal ma'am was telling in the first session, uh, mentioning about uh, our initiatives and our work. Thank you, I will just thank you ma'am for mentioning that one. Uh, getting into the topic that is the inclusion of transgenders in the mainstream job was uh, definitely an uh, exciting and also a challenging work for us. Uh, I would say the word exciting because uh, it's the first time in the history of India itself, like uh, such a big project is taking transgenders, that that will, these many number of transgenders into a mainstream job where they are facing the customers and passengers of a transport system. So, and that to full-time employment. So uh, for that one, we were really excited. And uh, at the same time, we were also having a challenging uh, time because uh, we were not knowing what all are the requirements of a transgender community uh, in a corporate environment. Since no one has done it, we were uh, hesitant uh, how we can do that one and what all uh, largely we require on that one. Uh, and uh, coming to how we came into this initiative is like, uh, as you may be knowing, few of you may be knowing, uh, we have in Kerala almost 3,000 transgenders numbers. And uh, in Kochi alone, we have almost 500 transgenders. So uh, as any other uh, city in India, uh, in Kochi also, they face legal issues, social 
as well as economic difficulties. Uh, they have restricted uh, access to education, health, and even uh, I would say that uh, the only way they get uh, their daily bread would be rather uh, sex work or by begging. So in particularly in Kerala, we could see transgenders only during the night time, that is from maybe 8 p.m. to morning 6 p.m. Other times, the people of Kerala is not used to see these people here until this project has come. So we were really happy that uh, the people of Kerala has welcomed this initiative in a very good manner and the response was very good. So uh, the problem uh, as uh, in 2016, our project has started, that is uh, the Kochi Metro Rail Limited started its operation in 2017. So in 2016, we had uh, issues like uh, there's transgenders having uh, many criminal activities in the city um, based on prostitution and robbery. And the uh, police department had uh, uh, requested uh, mainly to many of the corporates that anything can be done for a daily uh, wages so that they don't go for these type of works. So that moment we had an idea of okay, whether we can put them into the mainstream job. So that's how all this thing came up. So we took the help of police department itself. Um, uh, they gave us the resumes, the bio of uh, many transgenders who didn't have any criminal background. So uh, we took those people, uh, we trained them, we gave soft skill training, we gave them uh, how to uh, behave in a corporate environment. Uh, then um, we had took an interview uh, with most of them, we took the interview and uh, we selected few of them. And uh, not only uh, interview, uh, not only the training was given to those people, we gave even training to those other people who were going to work with these transgenders so that they have a good environment in our uh, stations. So these people were taken for housekeeping uh, management and customer relationship. Uh, crowd management and even uh, ticketing also in ticket counters also we could see few of the transgenders so uh, it was really a challenge for us during the initial time uh, to make them uh, get into the normal corporate environment and that was uh, then uh, two other uh, things which we have done was challenge which came during their uh, employment was um, they wanted a toilet. So we never thought that in our stations, uh, it was only the men and women toilet available. So uh, the requirement came that if we are working in the stations, we need a toilet facility also. So that moment we changed our uh, stations uh, uh, plans and certain things and made uh, available toilets available for them. Then they wanted certain few people wanted change in the uniform because uh, their, uh, even their uh, family didn't know that uh, they were transgenders. So they didn't want them to know also, even if they are working in Kochi Metro. So we needed to change our uniform for them. Uh, so even for that one, we were ready. Our management, Kochi Metro management was ready. Okay, if Kriji has to work here, then we will do that one. So. Uh, those things we were done doing. Then uh, one of the other thing which uh, we found challenging was the accommodation. The, normally the uh, people don't give accommodation for transgenders. So we had to talk to different people, different stakeholders telling that uh, these are our employees. Uh, they need, uh, they earn every month a particular amount. So they are ready to pay you. So the uh, houses or whatever has to be given for accommodation. So in that such ways, uh, we uh, could uh, make stakeholders understand that uh, even these people could come into the mainstream job. And um, also uh, once they started, uh, working in the stations, we had a very good response from the uh, people, from the public, from the passengers. We didn't have issues that uh, any transgender come and tell that uh, the passenger has uh, behaved me in a bad manner. Uh, they had issues from the customers. So uh, in, in that way, uh, I think we were blessed uh, with the uh, 
type of passengers we had, the type of public we had. So everyone has welcomed this initiative. And I think it has become a trend also to different metros to take this initiative. Uh, and uh, to the end, I would say uh, the challenge one thing we had is retaining them. Um, as the transgender have many medical issues, uh, we had a problem of these people taking leaves very frequently. So we need to tackle that one, how their leaves can be adjusted as per their medical requirement. So that was one uh, uh, thing which we had to handle very sensitively. And another one was their co corporate environment, adapting them to the corporate environment that they should come at this time, they should leave at this time. These are the etiquette which you have to follow in a corporate. So these were the few challenges we had, but uh, uh, we are happy that few of the transgenders are even now working, uh, working with us. And many of others are even planning to come back, come again to Kochi Metro. So we are just making planning for or a new drive in which we can add more transgenders into this one. And uh, apart from transgenders, we have uh, from Kudumba Street almost 600 plus people working for the customer relationship. It's all women. So whomever, the, any passenger coming to our metro station will be facing a woman. <laughs> there is no uh, a man to face everyone. And even we have a metro station itself, which is completely run by women. We have the station controller, the security, everything is done by a woman. So I think we uh, we were able to do a few things on this uh, sector uh, for an empowering woman. So telling this, I would uh, thank you, uh, the uh, com complete uh, team for giving such an opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great uh, presentation. And I congratulate you, uh, I think, for the project because uh, it has really put Kochi at the forefront, you know, and uh, it, it is really being discussed amongst one of the great initiatives happening, you know, under the mission uh, and also uh, otherwise. So thank you so much. And I thank you, yeah, I would also feel this project is a great case study and has a great potential for knowledge transfer to other cities who can emulate such an initiative. It will be lovely to see such similar projects happening across cities in India. So thank you so much. Uh, I don't see questions from the audience, but if, if you have a question in mind, please feel free to drop it in the chat. In the meantime, um, I have a few, uh, not questions, but I would invite uh, both of you, Ms. Arti Singh and Ms. Nadarada to reflect on a few things which came, uh, you know, uh, stood out in your presentations. So uh, Ms. Arti Singh, you in your presentation, highlighted, uh, you know, the challenges that you uh, faced while being, you know, on the job. Some of them were related to deeply ingrained uh, societal norms and behavioral patterns within the women, which come uh, from a very patriarchal sort of a setup, uh, to the lack of, uh, you know, conducive environment for women to work in the transportation sector itself. So do you have any anecdotes or any stories that uh, you can share with us, uh, you know, while, uh, while in the job, or even if you want to reflect more on this? Yeah. So actually, uh, I have many stories and I have limited myself so that, uh, you know, we don't go out of the time. So uh, like Kochi, uh, you all must have heard about Matunga Road Station of Central Railway. So similar initiative we also took in Western Railway. And uh, in Matunga Road Station of Western Suburban, we made it uh, fully run by women staff, female staff. So around uh, uh, 36 staff are still running uh, Matunga Road Station. And we started it in 2018, but uh, you know, it was, it came from the railway board that such initiatives have, uh, we need to proliferate. So we started, but after posting women in that station, we realized that, that, you know, that system needs so many changes that a station is just next to um, high, uh, next to main road. And there were many uh, night bars were there. So 
and that booking office is just adjacent to road. So uh, staff working at the booking office, they were uh, like dead scared at the night because anybody is walking and anybody is knocking their window. So, uh, and then uh, that uh, station master who was in platform, she was all alone in the night. So, uh, so just in one initiative, we need to take, you know, many steps to make it fully secure. We installed iron rods in uh, booking office and windows, we installed CCTV cameras, we installed emergency bells, and, you know, we uh, increased the patrolling. So just for one station, we did all this. And whereas, you know, so many women, female staff in booking offices and, uh, uh, station masters in other stations are also working. So that is how deficient is present structure is because they don't think about these issues. And another example is uh, if you, if anyone has visited Mumbai Central Station, like uh, the station which is for long distance trains. So ladies waiting room is in first floor. We have many uh, rooms in ground floor, but uh, you know, it never comes to anyone's mind that single lady traveling alone will never go to up, you know, first floor with uh, her luggage. So mostly women are, you know, waiting at the concourse area or at the platform. So even when I got posted and I pointed this to administration, then also there was so much resistance. Ki, what is the need? We have one ladies waiting room. So that is enough. You know, we had done our part times. So there are many stories, many examples, and you know I really feel for uh, these issues that we need to address, and that is why I say we need to address it from both the sides, not only from you know making it comfortable for women commuters and arranging safety systems, but uh, also for our inside customers, our uh, uh, our female staff, and it will come only when there are you know more staff. They, they are large in numbers. So these things are, I just wanted to say. Yeah, interesting. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so uh, we think uh, uh, Ms. Nadiraja had to leave. So um, let's, uh, let's, I think without uh, wasting too much time, let's uh, straight away move to the next session. Elsa, over to you. Uh, Elsa, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, you would have thought that after, you know, 18 months of using Zoom, you can unmute and mute without any hassle. But thank you, everyone, um, you know, for the, these amazing insights, Sonal, Aarti, Ashwati, and Sumi. Uh, they were really, um, you know, enlightening. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. But now we are going to go into breakout rooms for about 25 minutes. And we want to hear from you. We are going to use a Padlet. So this is what the Padlet looks like, where we are going to deep dive and ask you to talk about how might we incorporate gender sensitivity planning and responses to increasing women's access to mobility. And it has a plus uh, sign over here. So you can just uh, click on it. It opens up a little window where you can add your resources, share your stuff. And each breakout room will be uh, facilitated by um, someone from Red Dot Foundation or NIUA or the Urban Vision. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to ask Tanya to put us into the breakout rooms. But when we come back, we have three amazing entrepreneurs who are going to share with us their initiatives as well. Thank you, Elsa. Opening up the breakout rooms. So for those who uh, cannot find the breakout room, you might have to move your screen a bit if you're on the phone.
Smriti, you're in breakout room five. If you click on your screen, you'll be able to find the breakout room. Yeah, I'll try to do doing that. Thank you. Most welcome. Swapnali and uh, Zenul, you are both in breakout room five. If you click on your screen, you'll be able to see your room. Or at the bottom of the screen, you can join. Zenul, if... Hi, everyone. So Good morning. In Ria Choitani. I am I am 18 years old and I have a very small community startup which is based in local platforms. Other than that, I am a team leader at Anactis HRC. So we basically work for menstrual hygiene. We have our centers in Hewandi, Maharashtra, where we have women who stitch um, reusable sanitary napkins and we transfer them all across the country. We have our project in association with the Youth Innovation Challenge at Red Dot Foundation where we currently have got our very, very respected mentor, Ms. Madhvi Ma'am and Ma'am Elsa who's been guiding us always. So it's that pride is happening really Hey, thanks Ria. Ria, uh, who do you pass it on to? Uh, Uma Mehta, because I can see her on my screen. Uma, are you here? Okay, I guess Uma has just stepped out because... Or Uma, are you, you're on mute. How about Deepika? Hi, Deepika. I know Arushri said she wants to type because her, uh, her uh, so she says she is based out of Lucknow, but currently in Allahabad. I'm a data journalist and looking forward to a great discussion today. Great. Arushri. And uh, Deepika or Pratham. Uh, yeah. Hello. Hi, yeah, go ahead. Hi, very good evening. I'm Pratamesh. Uh, actually, I stay in uh, Mumbai. Uh, uh, I'm uh, like I took a part. I'm a particip I participate in uh, UN contest, like it's youth innovation. So I'm from the Midway River Warrior. So we are uh, actually our project is to uh, get a woman empowerment to the woman, uh, woman empowerment for the fisherman community. So we are working on it still. Yeah, we are working on it still. So we are going to clear the Mithi River and we are going to do some uh, oyster and crab farming in the Mithi River as well as we are also looking for a hydrophonics to start in the Mithi River, like floating and vertical hydrophonics. Yeah, I so can't we wait are to hear more about your project. Definitely. Oh, actually, youth I'm innovation uh, challenge is ongoing. Yeah. yeah, it's going good. Actually, our mentor is Mansi Sahu, ma'am. Uh, which uh, who is P POD? The voice is very strange. Yeah, so, Could you speak into the mic? Yeah, actually, I'm uh, outside, so uh, there is a uh, lot of voices. Yeah. Okay, Uma, have you come back? Okay, Uma seems to be not here or uh, she's on mute. So uh, it, it's nice to see all of you, Supreet, Ria, uh, Prathamesh, and Arushri. Uh, Elsa is also here. Hi, Elsa. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, it, it was a very 
interesting and refreshing first half. You know, most of the times when we talk about urbanism and development, we talk about the challenges of how difficult it is to build uh, livable and inclusive cities. So, so amazing to see examples of uh, solutions, uh, especially with government. I was totally blown away by that whole uh, stat that uh, Kochi Metro spoke about where they had 80% women in the workforce. Um, and I think it was ITDP's uh, Ashwati who said that have more uh, women in the workforce to kind of make cities more women friendly. So do we want to just go around uh, the room and uh, uh, can I, I, I can write on the padlet, but uh, do you guys want to uh, start sharing some ideas on what you think can make our uh, cities more uh, women friendly? You so, any? you know, I think when we are talking about mobility, uh, we live in Mumbai or we are used to the big cities, right? But if I take Goa, where my family is originally from, and I know Supreet's from Amritsar and also Kashmir, and then Arushi's Lucknow. I know Riyas from Jaipur. I don't know where Uma is from and Prathamesh, maybe outside of Mumbai. Think about a city outside of Mumbai and Delhi. And uh, think about what kind of options we have for mobility. In Goa, the cabs are all uh, handled by a mafia. So it's so expensive that something that you have to go for one kilometer will burn a hole in your pocket. And then obviously, you know, it limits your mobility because women may not necessarily have financial access to have freedom to move around. So that means then you are dependent on either owning a bike or your own car and stuff like that. So I just want to think about, you know, those kind of things as well. Yeah. You know, I can, can I add on? Yeah. Go ahead, Ria. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I had to interrupt you because there's some glitch. I'm so sorry. So um, I would really resonate here with what Elsa said. Because honestly, right now I stay in Jaipur, right? So at this point in time, I don't really know how to drive. I mean, I do know how to drive, but I cannot drive for long distances. And uh, there, there are times when I cannot really prefer a two-wheeler because I can't trust the weather all the time, first. And second, a two-wheeler riding it all to very distant places becomes a little too hectic. So at this point of time, the fear of going at, uh, being being someone who is still in college and you know who, is, who wants to travel to so many places like someday you have to meet someone or the other. So there are so many reasons that you have to travel for. But at that point of time, taking a cab every day is something which is not that safe. First of all, and second, taking a cab is a very distant option. Like you can always have two options when you take cab or even even three for that matter. There could be a bike that you could take, an Uber bike or a motor which is something which most of the girls of my age at least do not prep for. And second could be a cab, which is again a little scary. And the third thing, you can probably take something local, more like an auto or, or something like that. But I think all of these factors are really not all the time convenient. So of course, this is a question. You Traveling in buses where you, you don't find buses in cities like Jaipur everywhere. Right? You can find them on the main hubs of the cities. But when it comes to the local streets, the local lanes that you have to travel to or places, you cannot always prefer buses. You're saying we need more buses for last mile connectivity. And convenient and frequent. Yeah. Arushi also says in Lucknow, public transport is not good even with the new metro. It's not affordable for all. We need to look at the accessibility, affordability, and availability of the mode of transportation. Yeah, and I think, you know, this uh, pandemic has really hit the public transit systems. Uh, I'll, uh, I've been spending a lot of time in the villages during this pandemic, and apparently the bus networks have all been shut because it was all private sector, and there are not enough people, you know, kind of traveling. Uh, so a lo lot of women who work uh, in different areas are, you know, have had to kind of give up on their jobs. And uh, these are the kind of unintended consequences of these, this pandemic as well. So any more ideas on how to 
uh, you know, create more accessible, affordable urban mobility in smaller towns or bigger bigger towns? Supreet, Ria, Prathamesh. I was just busy writing in the Padlet so that <laughs> we have it all consolidated in one place. But yes, uh, uh, like I think a lot of other people said already, smaller towns, one, have very um, uh, limited numbers of uh, local uh, buses or local rickshaws that ply. So a lot of time women have to kind of fend for themselves. They have to walk or they have to ask for hitchhike or they have to ask for somebody to come, come and pick them up. Um, I now live in, uh, my parents now live in Amritsar and uh, it's always difficult for them to even get a vehicle to go to the um, hospital. Um, you know, even though they, ha they are from the army, they have the uh, option of calling for some uh, vehicles which are uh, given to army, ex-army people. Even then they can't, they can't just, they just can't seem to find uh, anyone who will come to their place and pick them up because there are hardly any vehicles. So one is that. Secondly, my mom doesn't like traveling alone in these cabs in Amritsar because uh, she doesn't feel safe even at even even in daylight she doesn't feel safe and it's a very congested city um i think we need to gender sensitize uh, transportation workforce uh, public transport workforce we also need to be for avenues for women to travel by women led uh, public transportation in other bigger cities Maybe we need to kind of have them in smaller towns as well. Uh, I know Vandana is here on this call also and she runs Taxi, which is run by women. I mean, imagine having something like that in Allahabad or, you know, Jaipur or Amritsar or Kashmir for that matter. Um, and Kashmir, Elsa mentioned Kashmir. So I belong to Kashmir and um, Srinagar uh, has uh, clearly there's, there's very restricted movement for women anyway. And whatever little movement they do have, they have to depend on these small um, matadors, they are called, which are packed. They are packed to the effect they are people who are hanging out, you know, holding onto that rail. And women are shoved, broke, pushed, um, and the society is extremely, extremely closed. They don't talk about such issues. They can't pick up such issues. So nobody does anything. And it's, it's, it's just people, there are women I know who, who skip college because that day the matadors are going to be full. So they skip a particular day in the week. Um, if, if they are having their periods, they the whole week they don't go to a college because uh, they clearly are being uh, packed in like, you know, really, really um, um, suffocating matadors and uh, they have to travel like that and it's very uncomfortable and clearly they get violated every time they go out of home and if they have to take a public transportation. So I think one, in cities like those, you need to have more uh, vehicles. Uh, and if we can have women-led uh, companies, great. Yeah, you're right, Supreet. I think that's a great point. If you had more women in the workforce, you it'll allow more women to kind of engage in the city in general. I know we have a few more uh, participants who've joined. There's Kapil Singh. Adrian, hi, Adrian. So nice to see you. Um, and someone else. So uh, Kapil and Adrian, do you want to share some more ideas? So we, we are, uh, you know, coming up with ideas on how to incorporate, you know, sensitive planning responses and design responses to increase women's access to mobility. And we're kind of capturing some of these uh, ideas in this Padlet. So uh, I'm going to share the link again, but I am, cap you know, I'm kind of actively uh, capturing whatever you guys are saying. Um, and I know Prathamesh just said, uh, my suggestion to you is government should provide ladies special bus on particular timing. Those should have proper tracking access, which will be very safe. Um, yeah, I think you know, it's, uh, I, I never really liked the kind of conceptual idea of uh, ladies coaches in the past, but considering the kind of challenges that I'm now seeing in cities, I think it's great. I think we need to kind of create safe places for women to travel. Adrian, did you have any thoughts 
on uh, how to make our uh, mobility more uh, you know accessible to women um okay well so hi everyone sorry i'm jumping on late um and i don't want to i guess say things that maybe were already discussed but i can just share from from my experience um we were like really looking at like even like a buddy system or like ways to kind of uh in groups or like coordinate taking transport together because when we work with um farmers outside of cities we find that there's a huge gap in terms of like who then gets to transport or do some of the moving around and who feels safe to do that um and we don't i don't really have any like proven solutions. I just know it's an issue that we are trying to figure out when we build a team of farmers where we want everyone to feel um, like, like they play an equal role or like they can do different parts of the job. Part of that does involve traveling or like traveling into the city or traveling around the city. Um, and so it's, yeah, I guess I'm just I'm, like, it's why I'm here. It's why I'm curious to learn more ideas and options. Um, but like for now, we had more something with like a buddy system. So familiarizing um in like a kind of learning and like doing it together way to start so that's kind of all we have right now okay that's such a great idea and i think we need to come up with more such affordable accessible ideas to you know create safe spaces for women to travel i mean it's not often just investing billions of dollars per kilometer of metro to make traveling for women more safer. Maybe it's programs like this. Uh, thanks, Adrian, for sharing that. Uh, Kapil and Zainul, uh, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, if you have any ideas on how to make mobility safer for women, uh, share it with us. And Arushri says, uh, uh, I have some thoughts with regards to Prathamesh suggestion of tracking access. How to ensure that we do not end up creating a surveillance state? Where to draw the line? And Supreet, you said something. I think there are short-term and long-term uh, sustainable solutions to make mobility uh, safer and uh, accessible. You know, as a transport planner in aviation, <laughs> I have a problem with women only transport, because if you are looking at optimizing your assets, which is your buses and trains and whatever, or even for that matter, cabs, and if you're only going to dedicate it to women, that means you cannot have it at a convenient time, frequently available for women. It will be sparsely spread out through the day, which makes it then inconvenient for women and defeats the purpose of deploying it because it won't get used. So I don't think that that it should be the view of planners. They should adopt a view on how to make it safer where the same asset can be used by everyone in a safe, inclusive manner. So that's how I would like to think about it. I yeah. even had a problem when Air India came up with women only rows, you know, why should I sit on a row only with women? Because sometimes, you know, when the plane is empty, you get two seats and you can stretch out. But if I am stuck on a row with women, that row is going to be packed with women and everybody else will have their empty seats. Think about it like that. So, you know, it's like it defeats the purpose. No, you're right. And so that's what I meant by long term and short term, because for some places like I was mentioning Kashmir, smaller towns like Amritsar, Srinagar, it's very difficult to want to get public transport and if you get it it's very difficult to find space for women so a lot of them kind uh, opt out of traveling by public transport which shouldn't be the case and uh, Zainul hi I, I realized that you run an NGO in Kashmir so I want to hear from you we would all like to hear what is the status of women and how do they travel in Srinagar how safe is it for them yes ma'am Zainul up here yeah, yeah, ma'am. हाँ, तो मैं मेरे पता है आप कश्मीर से हैं, मैं भी कश्मीर से हूँ, तो इसलिए मैंने सोचा आपको एक ग्रुप में ऐड करती हूँ। आप हमें बताएंगे सब तो हम सब इंटरेस्टेड हैं जानने के लिए कि विमेन का ट्रैवल कैसा है श्रीनगर में। 
जैनु आप म्यूट पे हो आई थिंक इज ट्रेवलिंग मैटर डॉट विच इज आई वॉन्टेड टू जैनुल आई यू हेयर आप हो यहाँ पे मेरी आवाज पूछ रही है पहुंच रही है हाँ जी जी मैं 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 यही बताना चाहूंगा कि जो श्रीनगर का है अगर हम पूरे जुम्मे एंड कश्मीर की बात करेंगे वुमेन का जो सफर रहता है कहीं भी जाने का खसूस जो भी पब्लिक ट्रांसपोर्ट है उसमें वो सिक्योर नहीं है उसमें उसको कोई भी इसमें ये नहीं रहता है इज्जत विकार नहीं रहता है क्योंकि देर आर सम क्राउड इन दी ट्रांसपोर्टेशन एंड ऑल्सो क्या बोल बेजती होती है क्योंकि जब भी वो मैन गाड़ी पे चढ़ जाती है उसको सीट नहीं मिलती है क्योंकि ड्यू टू अवरलोड ऑफ द ट्रांसपोर्टेशन फैसिलिटी और अगर हम स्ट्रीट्स की बात करेंगे स्ट्रीट्स में भी ऐसा ही जम्बलिंग होती है क्राउड होता है वुमेन को कोई इज्जत नहीं मिलता है और इसलिए मैं ये कहना चाह चाहता हूँ कि हमें इशू उठाना चाहिए कि खसूस हमारे श्रीनगर में हमें वुमेन को एक राइट देना चाहिए उसकी इज्जत के लिए हमें ये कदम उठाना चाहिए थैंक यू जैनुल आप बिल्कुल सही कह रहे हैं तो आप वहाँ एनजीओ भी चलाते हैं तो हम आपसे बात करेंगे मैंने आपको अपना ईमेल आईडी भेजा है आप प्लीज वहाँ पे मुझे लिखिए एंड हम बाद में इस पर कनेक्ट करेंगे कि हम क्या कर सकते हैं श्रीनगर में पर श्रीनगर में आप बताएंगे कितनी कितनी लेडीज हैं जो काम पे जाती हैं या एक्सेस करती हैं पब्लिक ट्रांसपोर्ट देखिए मैम अगर हम अगर देखा जाए मैं भी यूनिवर्सिटी से आ रहा हूँ मैं भी गाड़ी में ही था एक्चुअली क्या बात हो रही है जो भी मुलाजिम है अगर हम यानी कि ग्रुप डी की बात करेंगे या ग्रुप सी की बात करेंगे हर किसी के पास अपना प्राइवेट ट्रांसपोर्ट नहीं होता है और वो प्रेफर कर रहे हैं पब्लिक ट्रांसपोर्टेशन के लिए मगर उनको भी वही जिस तरह एक लेमेन के लिए होता है वही उनके लिए भी होता और फिर भी अगर देखा जाए स्टूडेंट्स का जो भी फीमेल स्टूडेंट्स होते हैं उनका क्या हाल होता है बहुत डिटी डिटीनेस है यहाँ ट्रांसपोर्टेशन में और वो भी अच्छी तरह नहीं है सर्विस टाइम टू टाइम नहीं मिल रही है सर्विस खसूस अगर हम स्टूडेंट्स की बात करेंगे बहुत जबरदस्त प्रॉब्लम हो रही है राइज ड्यू टू सम सॉर्ट ऑफ लेक ऑफ ट्रांसपोर्टेशन फैसिलिटी लेक ऑफ मैनेजमेंट मैनेजमेंट बाई दथॉरिटीज ऑल्सो हमें ये सुधारना पड़ेगा अगर हम आज नहीं ये सुधार पाएंगे कौन सुधार पाएगा उसको क्योंकि अब अब मैं भी इतना बड़ा हो गया हूँ बीस साल का हूँ मैं देख मैं देखता हूँ अगर हम जे के एस आर टी सी की बात करेंगे वो कुछ नहीं कर रहा है ट्रांसपोर्टेशन हती कि चाहे वो फीमेल हो चाहे वो मेल हो सब के लिए फिर प्रॉब्लम अराइज होती है यहाँ थैंक यू थैंक यू जैनु हम आपके साथ बाद में सेपरेटली uh, बात करेंगे हम चर्चा करेंगे आप ईमेल आईडी पे अपना डिटेल्स भेज देना हम कनेक्ट करेंगे हाँ जी मैम मैंने कॉपी किया है प्रतिमा ओवर टू यू yeah i think i've been uh, you know kind of collating some of these ideas on the padlet uh, please have a look at it and i recommend that throughout the next two days uh, continue to add some of your ideas there uh, i think we are you know very keen on um, looking at solutions at this urban thinkers campus and this is the decade of action so i'm so excited to see these kind of micro interventions that we can execute I know we are going to go back into the main room in about fifteen seconds, but please continue to add your ideas uh, on the Padlet, and we will, uh, you know, share that with the larger community and hopefully implement some of these.
So I hope you had a great session in the breakout room. I know certainly in our breakout room, we were, we were discussing about mobility in smaller towns outside of the big cities and what it will take to make it uh, easier, more gender sensitive and inclusive for women to use it at all times of day and night. So, okay, Aishwarya, I don't know what this is, but um, <laughs> yeah, we are now, I'm now going to hand it back to Swapnil to introduce our uh, entrepreneurs. Just give me a moment. Yeah, so uh, we move on to the next session. Uh, it's basically an entrepreneurial showcase and we have with us three uh, uh, well-known, uh, three really well-known people who have uh, worked extensively in the sector uh, on uh, mobility-based interventions, uh, processes and products. I first invite uh, Mr. Satya Sankaran he is uh, the co-founder of an organization called The Urban Morph, and he's a bicycle mayor. Uh, since 10 years uh, of experience uh, that he has in civic activism and mobility interventions, uh, uh, he's also an avid cyclist and, uh, cyclist, and he's been working towards a sustainable vision for Bengaluru since, uh, since a long time. This includes campaigning for solutions around planning, uh, uh, planning and governance uh, on NMT infrastructure planning and public transportation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Sankaran, and we would love to hear your insights on the topic. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Swapnil. Uh, my, I'm actually here on behalf of my uh, CEO and co-founder, Sonal. I can see her if you can pull her up, maybe she can park instead of me having to do that. But I'll share my screen in the meanwhile. Um, just have one uh, small thing to uh, talk about. Uh, I hope you can see this. Yes, we can. Please go. Right. So uh, not much of a journey. I'll just focus on uh, what is appropriate for this particular session. Uh, and what uh, and how Urban Morph has been trying to include uh, gender and gender sensitivity into the work that it has been doing. Uh, we've predominantly focused on uh, the accelerating of sustainable development goals, right? And uh, so we're trying to see how can we, uh, most of the talk that we have is about, uh, it is important to have uh, to move towards sustainable development goals, but we've been very hard pressed to actually make the change that is required because moving towards sustainability is like pulling the handbrakes of a car which is speeding on the highway. And we have to pull the handbrakes and turn around and see how we can do this. And a lot of it depends on uh, the people uh, and the choices they make today. Uh, and it's, it's very important to consider uh, uh, that. Uh, the four things that I thought I'll highlight uh, 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 before Sonal can explain more, is uh, one is we are led uh, by a woman and we have found that more and more uh, when we put women in this, is one of the things that I mentioned in, in the group as well, is when we put women in decision making, the outcomes are uh, uh, different, right? The empathy automatically comes in. Uh, uh, Sonal has been doing a lot of the work and I've been supporting uh, that work in uh, enhancing and making sure that it is more acceptable. The changes that we have done in Bengaluru as a city, which has moved towards the future of mobility, uh, depends a lot on the two women that you see in the first two, uh, uh, Sonal and the Commissioner of Directorate of Urban Land Transport, which is one of its kind of organization in the country for the state of Karnataka. More and more city states are moving towards an organization like that. It's kind of like the uh, unification uh, of urban transport initiatives, it's a planning body. And the commissioner there has also uh, played a pivotal role. Uh, she incubated, she made the department what it is over the first stint when she was the commissioner there. And she's come back now and doing a, a lot more. And I have also thrived in the process of uh, uh, her leadership. There haven't been too many others who've done much. Uh, 
uh, and these long stints uh, help in cementing certain decision making. And both Sonal, uh, she's actually uh, uh, gone back to help out uh, the DULT again with a lot of the changes that you see. And if you hear anything around uh, cycling and uh, walking and uh, placemaking in Bengaluru, uh, these two people will have a hand in it in some way or the other. And I would be also there uh, in some way to support. There are a few things that we have urban office strategically involved in. One is that we started the whole cycle to work program uh, in 2018, I launched it. September 22nd, car free day. It has been extremely transformatory. Uh, uh, but the sad part is uh, the uh, women who cycle to work has been less than 10%. And uh, it has moved from, the needle has moved from eight to nine and it's just staying around that. It's not more than that. Uh, and the biggest barricade is even though the program is usually successful and has led to the outcomes that you see, uh, we've used the data to make decisions. And uh, we've had cycle tracks on the outer ring road, the pop-up cycle lens during the pandemic, we've had, uh, uh, allocation, increase in allocation that we've campaigned for in the comprehensive mobility plan from 175 kilometers to 700. Uh, we've had a cycling district master plan, which it supported and provided data for. Uh, but the sad part about that is the uh, contribution of women has been low. And the biggest thing that I have heard is the initial hurdle of getting on a bicycle with the attitude of the family and how they see women cycling and because of their added responsibilities and the role they play in the family. It's been uh, slightly difficult for them to get off. And once the family support has been there and they've gotten on a cycle, most of the problems of the city remain the same, similar uh, for both the uh, for both the genders. Uh, uh, but it has been a little better in the Relief Riders program that we ran. We just recently won the 2021 uh, World Bicycle Day Award, special award uh, uh, of the United Nations. It uh, gathered together uh, 725 people who used the bicycle to provide COVID relief uh, across 12 cities. Uh, and in that, the women's participation was higher. More than the number that you see, uh, the back office and a lot of the campaigns, uh, a lot of the coordination that happened was led by uh, the women in the back office. It was, uh, the skew was almost 80 to 90% women in the back office. And that led to uh, more effective, I could say, subjectively, uh, because I feel that they just cut through the crap and just get the work done and it's an S or a no, there is no beating around the bush. Uh, we've also seen uh, that we've done uh, Cycle Day, which uh, uh, Sonal has been a part of and has been instrumental in running it for seven continuous years. It's the longest running open streets program in the country, continuously running. Uh, and it involved neighborhoods. And we found that a lot of the Cycle Days have been successful if they've been led by the women and you see them participate more uh, whatever the uh, uh, reason might be. Uh, and it also led to Church Street First, which is one of its kind of experiment where uh, we actually showed that there was an economic benefit of pedestrianizing streets. And a lot of people felt safer across genders. A lot of people felt safer when, when it was pedestrianized. And it had a lot of uh, benefits, which people feel today, if you go to Church Street and you see the traffic whizzing past and people uh, being thrown out, you start realizing how much of a benefit we're actually losing. So uh, I just gave a lens of gender in the work that we have done. We do a lot more work around uh, energy and uh, waste management and circularity and electric vehicle transition uh, out of fossil fuels. But I leave that for a different occasion. Uh, uh, if Sonal is still there and can speak, I would like her to add something more. Hi, Satya. Thanks for, uh, uh, yeah just for speaking about what we're doing around uh, uh, mobility and uh, specifically uh, it's it's led by a lot of women and worked towards by a lot of women so uh, I think uh, it's definitely bound to be women friendly or uh, women oriented at least uh, so yeah I mean uh, I, uh, I just wanted to add that uh, now that I am in the directorate of urban land transport again and uh, working on many initiatives. Uh, we are trying to focus a lot on how we can make public spaces more women uh, oriented and friendly because a city is seen very differently by a woman, right? Uh, and it's experienced very differently by a woman. So uh, keeping that in mind and uh, around almost 56% of our, uh, or, uh, of the staff at DULT is also women actually. So the percentage is really uh, high here. And uh, all the projects that we do uh, are slowly uh, getting that one more layer of, uh, you know, how a woman sees any project that we do and how she might experience it. 
So that's definitely coming in in any project that we do. Uh, one example I would like to give is uh, the Sustainable Urban Mobility Accords that we're doing as part of an extension of Cycle Day. Uh, so in Cycle Day, we just created awareness. But now what we thought was we would, we would like to engage in a very different format with the, uh, with the local uh, you know, RWAs and the residents of Bangalore in creating sustainable neighborhoods. That way they get the ownership of it and uh, they are also sold to the idea of whatever is being created and, and not just an uh, observer or like a, you know, critic, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, just a, uh, a sitting silent uh, critic on Twitter or something like that. So they are actively involved with us in creating the infrastructure. So as part of this project, we had a lot of focus group discussions and we thought it was important to have a focus group discussion specifically for women in each neighborhood. So that's, we got a lot of uh, insights from that. And uh, we are incorporating that in any proposal that we are going to create for that particular neighborhood. Now we have around uh, seven neighborhoods that we have identified where we're working in Bangalore. Uh, so that's one thing that we are doing. And the other thing that we are also uh, did was a livelihood cyclist survey. And in that uh, we found very like surprisingly that there are a lot of uh, livelihood women, but uh, they do not use the cycles for very different reasons. And the reasons that we found through the survey was also very, very informative for us to understand why like a livelihood women, I mean, uh, a, li uh, a, a woman from a lower strata, why wouldn't she use a cycle, uh, for example? So that report is also going to be released very soon. So uh, I don't want to talk more about it before it's released. Uh, so that's another thing. And the uh, third thing that we are actually doing is now actually deep diving into uh, finding out how we can do uh, data disaggregated by gender and by many other uh, things. So uh, what is the kind of, uh, you know, uh, things that we would like to institutionalize within various government departments so we get data also which is disaggregated so we understand the uh, trip patterns of women how they uh, you know how they travel for what they travel uh, some like homemakers they travel only for uh, for example to drop their kids to school or for local groceries so what is the kind of trips that they do so uh, these kind of data we want to learn more and more in the city of bangalore now uh, and and we are actually signing a mou with iisc to do this and uh, yeah, Satya is also part of uh, this project, actually. Uh, so th these are the different things that we're doing here in Bangalore related to uh, women and mobility. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any around whatever we are trying to do here. And it's exciting, actually. It's exciting times for uh, all of us to be uh, doing many different things, actually, and uh, not just the same old stuff that uh, many consultants are doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both uh, 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 Mr. Sankaran and Sonal for, uh, for a lovely uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, uh, this, this, you know, uh, initiatives such as these campaigns and uh, pilots uh, are really, uh, you know, they have great potential from, you know, being ideas to creating impact and scale. And I'm sure that the work that you've been doing, um, I mean, all of us, including me, would love to go back, read about it, you know, in detail uh, about what are the different, uh, uh, you know, measures and initiatives you actually took on ground to make uh, these things happen. We'll take question and answers uh, towards the end. Uh, but I'm really excited uh, to introduce our next speaker, um, uh, Devya Kalya Sharma. Uh, she is a co-founder and chief information officer of a startup in the intelligent mobility space. Uh, it's called Bixi, and it's the world's first tech-based gender-customized two-wheeler taxi and delivery service. Uh, this was founded with the idea of addressing the issue of congestion on Indian roads and soon surfaced the multiple, multitude of positive side effects it created on that journey. I'm sure uh, Divya has a lot, lot of anecdotes and experiences to share from her journey as an entrepreneur in this space. 
so uh, i would not take up too much time in the introduction and divya i would uh, invite you to present uh, your uh, uh, your talk thank you so much uh, am i audible uh, can you hear me well yes yes Okay, perfect. So, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to speak to you all. Uh, what I would want to point out is that not only do we need women's participation in the men's forum of the public domain of planning, etc., that we've been speaking about, we also need a lot of men in such forums. It seems there are a lot of women over here in this particular event. Uh, you know, who who care about uh, you know women's participation in uh. An increase in women's participation in the mobility sector and in um, uh, across the geographies, but uh, uh, less of men over here. So yes, we need men's participation in such forums as well. One uh, one important thing that I felt today. Um, and uh, so let me just introduce myself. Um, so my name is Divya Kalia Sharma. I am uh, the founder and chief Inf information officer at Dixie. Uh, by professional background and education, I'm a data scientist. And uh, th th that's the reason I started heading the, the technology and the information and data side side in Bixie. So Bixie basically started as a, a two-wheeler taxi company. And the reason we started this is because I was traveling 35 kilometers from my house to work every single day. And I was actually facing a lot of issues traveling. And uh, you know the, 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 the public transport was congested. The roads were congested. Uh, you know, there was so much traffic on the roads, uh, uh, you know, pushing harassment so much was happening on the roads it was really not easy to travel and i used to wonder you know why can't we have a better mode of transport which is more affordable you know i can't afford an uber every day for 35 kilometers and it's not even effective you know i'd be traveling three hours a day on one side uh, so that's six hours of travel you know that's impossible how will i manage home and work and work-life balance you know so that's a feeling i felt a lot of other women were also grappling with and that's the reason that i started thinking okay why why aren't two wheelers more um, uh, used as a taxi service on Indian roads. And when we started thinking about two wheelers as a taxi service, I started thinking that, okay, will I be comfortable on this form factor sitting behind a man uh, in such proximity? You know, what if he breaks? You know, will I have to hold his shoulder? Will I have to hold him by the waist? You know, will I bump into him? If I am not comfortable, given who I am today, uh, will other women in my country be comfortable availing this service if I introduce it for women as well? And if I don't, you know, then it'll be a pretty non-inclusive service. And that was not an idea I was comfortable with. So we started this service in 2016 with 10 men and five women as well. And we were lucky to find those five brave, courageous women, you know, who decided to enter into this particular profession, which was basically like a man's world out there. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk about taxi, uh, generally, you know, you think about men. Uh, when you talk about two wheelers, the first thing that strikes to you is men. And, you know, as Sonal Shah pointed out in our presentation, 90% of, uh, you know, two wheelers are being driven in India by men. So, uh, you know, that number becomes even more skewed if you talk about how many uh, women actually own two wheelers. So that's, that number is even lower. So, uh, what we realized that, uh, you know, we needed to have a more inclusive service. So this was a tech-based, app-based, uh, you know, uh, startup and uh, taxi service. And we decided to have it uh, gender customized, men for men and women for women, so that women could feel comfortable sitting behind another woman. Would you believe that, you know, I soon realized that affordability was not the only reason that women, women were coming uh, to us to avail this service. You know, women who could actually afford uh, an Ola and Uber for their journey, uh, which costed them almost 10 times more than what my service was costing them, still wanted to avail a two-wheeler taxi service because, you know, it was an open mode of transport. They were sitting behind a woman. They felt more comfortable. You know, it just made a lot more sense. And, uh, you know, uh, we another stereotype that we actually ended up breaking was the youth factor. You know, we generally, you know, two-wheelers associated with youth, you know. Uh, would you believe that my um, most vintage uh, female pilot, and we call them pilots, is that uh, is a 44 year old woman, and uh, she uh, regularly takes a 65 year old woman uh, behind her to ferry her to and back from home. And uh, you know, it, it it was actually breaking stereotypes left, right, and center, and it was actually very empowering. But when it came to uh, actually achieving scale out there, you know, we realized that to achieve scale, we have to get more women pilots into our uh, you know uh, organization, and uh, it became a challenge because uh, you know where do 
do I find such women? You know, who a knew how to drive uh, a, a motorbike and were confident enough to ferry another person on an Indian road, and I was confident that they wouldn't actually, you know, uh, do something which was untoward, and you know, something happens to either of them. So, uh, so this was a big challenge for us. And uh, you know, Big C actually, when we started expanding, we realized that we'll actually have to come up the curve of actually. uh educating such women you know training them providing them the vehicles uh providing them with the uh, uh driving licenses thankfully bmw uh globally came out as a big shout out as a partner and they became our global partners for training such women uh you know which was amazing you know and we never expected uh, you know organizations like that to come out and help us um so we ended up uh, not only putting women on electric vehicles which was em- environment friendly we also ended up uh, you know providing the service for i mean um, employing about 100 female drivers and more across so many cities uh, which was uh, beautiful because you know then they could uh, actually ferry so many uh, women and um we used to follow them around to talk to customers and we realized that uh, mothers were comfortable sending their daughters which uh, behind our female pilots and earlier what they were doing was earlier they were taking their car out you know dropping off the daughter on to a tuition center or wherever the the daughter needed to go again go out uh, with a driver or the father or the driver or the mother goes to pick her up now these uh, women uh, you know the mothers were actually sending their daughters with our female pilots because they felt you know the daughter was safe which was very empowering for us you know that finally you know that lady at home can actually attend to many other things you know because a woman has like multi hat or you know many things that we we juggle with every day so here's my presentation i'm just going to start sharing my screen just a minute one second let me just figure this out okay can you see my screen as my screen yes yeah yeah we can see Oh, all right perfect so okay so big c pink is a micro mobility solution for women in india which is tech based environment friendly because we are on e bikes uh we got the yellow number plates in place uh, which means it's a taxi service it's a last mile transport and delivery solution on two wheelers for women by women and let me just make this bigger okay the key issues are uh, plaguing the country last mile transport and delivery especially last mile you know not just a to b but you know women generally carry a lot of bags and you know uh, run errands have children you know last mile becomes the biggest problem because not only is it uh, inadequate suboptimal expensive non tech based it's not environment friendly or it's all of the above you know it's it's it has so many issues plaguing last mile uh, it's uh, it's not effective at all and uh, to have weights uh, you know uh, baggage or, or or groceries or kids and it's not easy to manipulate that um women safety another big issue you know traveling commuters and uh, are my female pilots they both needed to be secure you know safety is a big issue in the country unfortunately uh low female workforce participation rate another big issue we wanted to address we address this one shot with this solution Uh, mobility patterns as many people have already discussed i won't spend too much time on it running house and errands traveling with children elders restricted geographical area that you frequently travel low speeds uh, many household responsibility frequent trips and multiple stops so this is general mobility patterns that we discovered through our data uh, in bixi uh, issues that women face again i won't spend too much time it's already been discussed in detail harassment it's expensive it's unorganized and uh, you know uh, radio taxis are very very unsafe it, women felt that they were telling us because the controls were with the drivers they could lock the windows they could lock the door with one click of a button and it felt very unsafe for many women so that's why they you know even when they could afford uh, radio taxis they were they were they preferred going with us uh it is inefficient there is unrealistic waiting times for home delivery now women are also the chief procurers for the household many goods that we needed to get in place uh you know for uh, the household to function effectively and waiting times were not helping you know um and there was no designated service per, per se for women we are in india and globally the first uh, service provider for women uh, by women on two wheelers um so this is bixi solution we were empowering women uh, you know it was a pleasure to see the transformation we were making in their lives uh for the women pilots i mean it was a, a huge change you know i my i want to give an example my first woman pilot uh, kanjan uh 
she actually was so shy. She never used to talk to anybody, including other women, uh, you know, when she joined us. And today she is the most outspoken in Bixi and I feel so happy to just to interact with her. Uh, we have environment friendly bikes, uh, gender customized service and everything on one app. So there's uh, delivery and commute, all of it happening, all the action on one app. Uh, generally also I've witnessed that women are more tech savvy when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, transport and commute and delivery. So this is Bixie's app. We have commute uh, in ride and ride sharing, selfless dockless rental, uh, self-drive dockless rental, on-demand delivery and pick and drop service, everything on one app. Uh, there is my team and that's it. This is, uh, this is all of us. I would like to play a small video. Uh, Elsa, do I have the time to play a small video? Uh, can, I... can we do it later? Because, uh, you know, we are running out of time. No. Maybe in the Q&A section. Sure. Okay. All right. Perfect. So I'm done. Any, any questions we can address later. Thank you. No, thank you, Divya. Thanks so much. That was a really passionate talk. It's really heartening to see how your personal lived experience, you know, turned into a business and now really has become an impact driven organization. So more power to you and to such, uh, such uh, work and ideas. I would now uh, welcome our uh, next speaker, uh, uh, Ms. Vandana Suri. Uh, we all, uh, most of us know about this uh, wonderful initiative called Taxi. She's the founder of Taxi. Uh, uh, it's a safe mobility platform for women and kids in Bangalore and Delhi NCR. Uh, uh, Taxi is an enterprise uh, that is an interesting initiative where one finds uh, women drivers employed to ferry school children, women to offices, and late night airport drives. I let uh, Ms. Vandana Suri discuss details of her initiative, but uh, uh, a little bit about her, you can see uh, details in the chat box, but something that really stood out to me was her uh, belief and her passion to take uh, action and uh, to create impact. Uh, and uh, the all women driving service, uh, which not just targets benefiting women, but also addresses the multiple interrelated uh, uh, work and uh, challenges faced by women. So addressing the needs of women, children, uh, you know, uh, in tandem. Uh, and that I think that is really interesting. I invite you, Man, to uh, kindly reflect. Hi, everyone. This is Vandana Suri. I'm the founder of Taxi. Um, I think the story started much, much earlier for all of us uh, as women. I think each one of us has gone through the Me Too movement. Everybody has contributed to this. Everybody's been touched wrong. And somewhere, uh, this was really, really burning inside me as to what am I supposed to do about this? Um, 2014, uh, this is post Nirbhaya. There was a rape in an Uber in Delhi. And that really triggered me. Next day, the headlines came that if this would happen, would have you know, if there was a woman driving me, this would not have happened. And that really shook me up, actually. It's, it's, it's a, what, what a practical thing, right? She's talking correct. And that's what made me take the plunge. Uh, I'm an investment banker, and I decided to become a taxi driver. Then and there. Um, it's been an amazing journey for me. You know, what I realized being a taxi driver myself was the fact that uh, yeah, it can give good revenue, but then I'm not safe if I'm just driving any Tom, Dick and Harry. I don't know, no man is carrying that certificate on his head that he's a safe man for me. So I realized that I did not want to drive men and I, my own safety was very, very critical. That's where we designed a, a vertical wherein women drivers would drive only women and children. So I had to keep my protagonist, every single one of them safe. And that's how the whole business was, you know, designed around this. The second thing was the data that was coming up. 53% of our children face uh, sexual abuse. Most of them went out of sight of parents. And transport is a very, very strong place where, you know, parents don't have access uh, to their children. Schools still carry CCTVs. So with 53%, it's my child or the neighbor's child. It's a very big number, uh, which we've all faced abuse ourselves. That was, so that's when we started designing, you know, so our services became like an oxygen mask. I can't have it for everybody. Women drivers were so less uh, 
if you count the numbers there must be hardly about 200 and women 200 250 professionally driving women cabs today in the country and i'm talking of numbers these are not companies right uh, so we thought okay let's do this morning to evening this lady will drive kids to schools and tuitions uh, that's when I think that was the clientele who really needed us the most. And evenings, we can cater to women. I think women were pretty safe in the daytime in the cabs. So morning to evening, we drive kids. Uh, late evenings and late night airport drives is something we catered on for women. Um, surprisingly, we were overbooked. Not surprisingly, I think we were just overbooked. February 2020, we had a waiting list of 4,500 parents wanting to, to enroll their children with us. Um, so there was a huge waiting list. Um, I must also tell you that we run a 50 square foot office. I literally have two seats left in my office and we were given by an award. We were given an award by the World Bank for the impact we were creating. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's like this is so important that such a small organization like mine gets such a big recognition. But this is so in the face. I also want to tell you what happened during the pandemic. We went berserk to you know because i think pandemic is hit everybody out of us um schools were stopped so my core working was 90 percent of my work was with schools and then the 10 percent was with you know women coming home schools were closed corporates were closed um airports were closed and we were totally lost as to what do we do now customers were scared about taking public transport oh my god if she has covid or where's this person coming from who was the last client sitting in the car these were ground realities so I could have made a delivery service for a big basket and use my cabs during that time. But then my ethos of keeping things safe for women uh, and children, that was not uh, happening, right? With me just being a delivery agent. So I said, no, this is not what I want to do. So we thought of something else. Now we realized that this in this last six years, we had trained around 350 women uh, from the marginalized communities, women who never sat in their cars, who didn't know where the key goes, we had taught them driving and we had taught them to be professional drivers. And we used the same skill that we had of training women to train customers now. So we had a lot of women who were now wanting to self-drive, educated women who said, you know, I don't want to be stuck in my house waiting for my husband or somebody to take me out. And I want to drive myself. So the same we used to train women how to drive their own cars. We started it very differently. We went off the driving school dual clutch module. So if a lady had an automatic, we were training her on an automatic. If she had a, um, uh, you know, an SUV, we'll train her on an SUV. So we started making women comfortable in driving their own cars. And the impact this had was even much more than what we imagined, okay? So for us, it was about using our skill. It was the same pizza base. I'm just changing the topping and I'm, you know, bringing out a different pizza. But the impact that this created out there for women, the independence that it brought in, um, women were so suffocated sitting at home during the pandemic. Domestic violence was at an all-time high. And this became a getaway for women. Okay, this became a getaway that I can go when I want to go somewhere. Um, this became a matter of pride for women with their children. Their children are like, oh, wow, my mom can drive. So all the time they've seen their, their mothers being very typically typecasted at home. Hey, women can't drive. And you know how the entire, um, you know, patriarchy around this. And the next generation now sees a different mom. Right. And. I think this is the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. Uh, it, made, it put me down financially, yes, from an investment banking job to this. But I think I'm super, super excited about the way this has worked out. So while I was going through all the conversations today, I realized, um, and you know, the founder of Big C was out here. Um, I realized that there has to be gender segregated transport. If women are driving women, those women are also safe customers are also safe you can't just think of the you cannot just think of women empowerment as just a job giving a woman ki chalo tum taxi chalalo and tum paise kamalo no it doesn't work she will not work and that is the main reason why uh, there are very few women taxi drivers uh, in the country because our existing systems ola ubers and our existing transport system 
does not give them a segregated client base. Um, I think this is our way of stopping me too for the next generation. I want to get up and I want to, I want my kids telling me, hey, what the hell were you fighting about? I want that day to be seen. And, you know, that's my goal, uh, you know, and this is where I am growing. Every day we are thinking of a new solution. I think women carpools, uh, women carpooling only with women, you know, your quick rides of the world, if they have a gender segregated system, that itself brings uh, safer ecosystems. Um, you know, you have to think gender segregated. Uh, let the world think, hey, women are only asking for their rights. I think we're just right, asking for the right to be safe. I don't think it's a luxury. It's, it's a necessity, right? Okay, I'm open to questions. You can all shoot your questions and ask me what you want to ask. Thank you, Vandana. I think that was a brilliant presentation. Also brilliant presentations from Divya, Sonal and Satya. And I'm going to bring everybody in. But uh, Vandana, you know, I was an aviation planner in my previous wow. after before Red Dot Foundation. And I do have a problem with segregated transport, you know, mm -hmm. as a planner, where you're trying to optimize assets. And I said it in my breakout room, you know, then you're underutilizing your assets because often uh, your um, you know seats will go empty, right? And that's uh, um, you can't recover that money once that ride is in process. So no, actually, that's not assets? true. That's not true at all. I, I'm I'm telling you, we had a four thousand client wait list going on. There is so much demand uh, that. Uh, like, you know, the uh, the lady at Bixie was saying that the girls are not free at all. Uh, we are not free. We are waiting for breathing space. There is so much demand uh, for safety. Uh, you know, by the time the industry opens up, it's a very nascent industry. You know, I, I think it's years and years uh, for, a, for a country like 133 crore population. If we have about 250 women uh, who are driving cabs. You just imagine uh, where is the weight, you know, uh, there, there is no empty seat there. I don't have an empty seat. I have parents fighting with me for two, two years. Hey, you've not taken my kid yet. I said, hello, I need people on the same route to start that route, right? So uh, it's a very different on ground reality. Maybe in the aviation, it might be very different. Um, but in the, in the ground reality transport, no, we have, we are overbooked all the time. So I think uh, I'm going to ask Aarti Singh because Western Railway also has at peak times a full yes. train full of women and that really makes all the difference, I think. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, when you're talking and maybe this does not apply to smaller means of transport yes. like yes. bikes and cars, yes. you know, like mass public transport. And one of Correct. the things when we're, when we're thinking of climate action is how do we move people to take mass transport? Because whilst we, are, we feel safer in a private transport or an individualized transport, that's not going to solve the problem in the long run. So Arti, you raised your hand, but I also wanted to ask you to weigh in on this. And I'd also like to ask Divya, Satya and Sonal to switch on their video so we can bring them in at this point. Yeah, so uh, as much I agree with Vandana that we feel safer uh, while in taxi if woman is driving. For mass transportation, you know, it goes very negative. What happens, Western Railways is running uh, 10 uh, services, especially for women, and Central is also running, I think, 9 or 10 services. But what happens that you wait for those services, and they will be very much scared if they could not get into those services. You know, so in larger picture, we need to make every service accessible and safe for women. So that they don't, you know, they are not constrained in those timings. Okay, okay I have to leave my, my office at 5.30, otherwise I'll miss that woman is special. No, I don't want my commuter to be, you know, you know, restricted in those timings only. I want that you know, it should be safe. Every service should be safe. And so, so in larger pers uh, picture, we need to think of a society of mass transportation system where even at odd hours, a woman can travel. And in Mumbai, though, it is actually achievable. We women are traveling in the night and they are feeling safe. So touch wood. 
but uh, yeah it is comparatively it is a safer city but i think other cities should follow mumbai uh, you know in all these aspects thanks arti can i sorry we have a we have a question and maybe then you can weigh in sonal you know uh, arushi says gender segregated system creates equitable system for sure but i have a different take on it in the short medium time we can strive for exclusive segregated spaces but shouldn't our long term goal be about inclusivity she and she's getting a little confused so uh, sonal maybe it, you wanted to say something related yeah. to this but uh, feel free to add yeah i mean i i just wanted to add that uh, so it's it's not only one segment of women we are looking at we are also looking at different segments of women which include like the poor uh, poor strat of society and everyone and they can't afford these services like the uh, you know a taxi or a two wheeler taxi or whatever you call it so they still need options which are safer and they are the most vulnerable in a city actually because they work at odd times they travel at odd times if you see the uh, uh, women who work in the industrial sector uh, in bangalore itself uh, they they really you know i i see women in buses at like 5 5 30 going to their workplaces uh, so it's it's these people whom we should also think about and um, and and this is the segment that we also should uh, target so if we if we make public transport and uh, uh, cycling and walking safer for this segment i think it covers uh, a, a lot of the other segments as well so it's yeah i i feel like uh, equity uh, weighs in here i think you're right sonal and what uh, vandana is trying to say is that for the entire country of 1.2 billion there are only 250 women uh taxi drivers and there therefore if we are talking about the huge middle class you know there is a great opportunity over there too and i hear what arti is saying because when you have mass transit that is under utilized then policy makers or government is going to say who's going to who's going to fund these initiatives when they are under utilized so it's a conundrum in my view but um like sonal shah said right at the very beginning that unless we measure it we are never going to find realistic holistic solutions i have a question for divya and maybe then vandana as well you know when um, i think it came up in our previous segment and arti also said you know the behavior change when you're first starting out like these women as drivers or bike riders they have to challenge societal taboos to take on that job even if they want it right how do you address it and the second one is i know because i've been following vandana's work right from the beginning policy does it go tandem with your ideas and entrepreneur because in the beginning women were trained as taxi drivers but because they didn't rack up the hours of driving they weren't officially allowed to of uh, handle uh, drive officially as taxi uh, drivers and so vandana came up with this amazing intermediary solution of having them as private drivers and then they could get jobs with other companies so how does how do you deal with all these one behavioral uh, challenges and then policy challenge devya you want to go first sure hi um big very big issue yes uh, we faced both of these challenges uh, but you know what uh, that is the reason i wanted to play this video uh, i wanted you to see for yourself uh, through this video uh, you know how we address this because i think you know what uh, when you talk about behavioral challenges the behavioral challenge is not only for the woman you know to actually uh, put that thought in her head that okay she can do this okay you know maybe she can take up this job as a woman pilot and you know uh, get out of her house get out of her regular clothing attire uh, you know and uh, don a, uh, a uniform a, a nice uh, pant suit and actually become a pilot i mean this is empowering for them but this is also very challenging for them but the bigger challenge is the family because the family will never even you know a conceive b allow or c uh, even you know support them in any manner but you know what happened uh, that this was what we were thinking would happen and this did happen in a lot of cases but it did not happen in a lot of other cases when we actually realized that the family was actually supportive 
and these were women you know who, who were coming from a village background you know very marginalized backgrounds wherein you know their sisters or their you know uh, peers or you know uh, bhabis or whatever were actually in, you know pallus and ghungat and uh, you know covering their faces and you know while these women you know in one of the videos you know actually the husband talks about okay earlier she used to wear a sari then she went on to a, a salwar kameez and now she wears a pant suit and that's very fine with me and you know it's very empowering to actually hear that you know he's becoming more and more comfortable with the woman getting out of the house earning supporting him taking care of the kids all the same time and uh, actually um, you know making an impact in her life and their lives as a whole so the behavior change has to come from the family also not just for the woman and that's a very big thing to do because you can reach the woman you know maybe you can reach her in an ngo or something but how do you reach her family because when she goes back to her family you will not be with her to stand with her to talk on her behalf you know she'll have to do the talking herself and if that is stemmed at that moment then you've lost her you know she will never be ready to be employed in in your organization so that is a very big challenge yes you know um so so that is very important and sorry what was your next question i forgot policy change or policy challenges so yes uh, you know um, uh, i basically my biggest challenge when it came to policy was initially with respect to bike taxis itself bike taxis were not allowed in india period you know when we started thinking of the idea of having a two wheeler taxi service uh according to the motor vehicle act of india it was not only allowed so uh, so we actually had to go to talk to a lot of policy makers at the government level state and union to actually make them understand that okay two wheelers could also be applied as a taxi you could give them a, a yellow number plate and try them 2015 november is when haryana was the first state in india when they opened up the uh, uh, two wheeler taxi service for uh, on, a, on in the, the change the motor vehicle act you know uh, which was a legacy which was going on since the british times and uh, haryana became the first state to change it and then eventually uh, you know a lot of other states followed and it's still not allowed all across india but you know having women per se apply two wheeler taxis that was never a challenge for us two wheeler taxis per se were the challenge vandana yes <clears throat> so the first the first challenge we faced as far as uh, policy was concerned was that if you had to apply a taxi then you had to have a commercial license commercial license needed a a, a regular license for one year to then get into the commercial now women in the marginalized segments don't have the luxury of owning a car and practicing it for one year right i mean and they will also learn and so i also run an ngo so working tandem uh, as a business as well as an ngo really makes sense like you know talking to their families going ngo grows gra grassroots and you know business goes up so anyways uh, so we did have this challenge which we circumvented because we said okay we are training them how to drive let them drive other people's cars great you can't drive a commercial vehicle we'll go around it and so we had people who happily gave in their cars for car pooling and we then you know accumulated kids in one apartment took one parent's car and attached a driver by the time one year went and then they all started getting their commercial licenses the second problem that came was for a commercial license you had to have a minimum 10 standard certificate now women in the marginalized communities are not more than second third standard actually when they reach puberty they are out of school so where is this going to come so you know it was a very difficult way to get through today commercial license for cars has been withdrawn by the um, the government itself by the supreme court thankfully after a lot of battle uh, at the same point of time you know what will really really work Uh, in a larger scenario is like the uber system which works across the globe where people just attach their cars with uber and they do drives as and when they come when they are free now we face this thing where a lot of even the lower middle class and the middle class women would not be seen in a taxi number no 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 my family will not be seen with a yellow board in the car because it's very stigmatization 
and if, and if that can be taken off for women you know so they can commercially use their cars as well they will be making an income and there will be much more transport on the roads um while i do see uh, you know uh, questions out here so how does this globally span out and on a larger number yes uh, uh, of course when it comes to mass uh, there has to be a different solution uh, these are all smaller solutions which kind of fit in to the larger goal i can't solve everybody's problems i can solve how much i can see and at least you know like big c is doing this like satya is doing this sonal is doing we are all fitting in our little solutions on the ground and all of these coming together itself solve the larger problem right uh, i think that's that's uh, what i have to say thanks vandana maybe satya can answer this by nishu nishu kumari who says that if someone comes from a poor city or village where there are no safety guide guidelines available and she does not even have a phone due to her low economic conditions then how can she save herself as well as educate rural people about harassment so it's a combination of um, many things but do you want to take a stab at it and then i can also try no so i think you may try it better because this is the problem we are trying to solve the larger goal is very clear right what uh, vandana said in the end is very important businesses work to reduce the risk of their current reality and see how we can quickly operate and be successful in doing what they are doing so it's important that the short term goals are addressed so that the business continues to survive and uh, you know serve uh, whatever it is to make the larger change <clears throat> of behavior is something we have to see how all of them fit in right everybody in their small ways how is it adding to the larger goal and what is that larger goal it is what somebody was asking is that we have to have an equitable society uh where we understand and uh, respect uh, uh, all genders uh, in a right way i can give you this example i gave this in that uh, sub group also is that i teach at a, a women's college and when i go there physically before uh, covid i have to take one toilet on the fourth floor uh, and ask around i had to ask around so i know what it feels like to be in the other world and so that empathy is not there who creates that empathy and how do we get there is very important to note um, how the shoe is on the other foot now how many people do we get them to empathize what it feels like to not have adequate toilets or other facilities right so solving the immediate problem is how businesses will get by over the long term we need other actors to step in and see how do we make this unsegregated and non segregated you can consider this the quota for now uh, to get by but we can't take the eyes off the long term goal we need an equitable society this is behavioral change in india each city is different inside bangalore i see one set of people behaving and accepting this some nuclear families are more uh, foregoing whereas the traditional uh, families have those stigmas attached so you can imagine what it will be like if you go 50 kilometers out of the city it might be totally different and i don't know how they uh, so it's it's a lots of problem to solve how do we start chewing this thing and where do you start public transport is a great equalizer we need to figure out how to get the thing going maybe that's the place where we start and not in the private transport um, so that's how i feel about this but maybe you can answer the question better yeah i mean it's a very difficult question especially if you're in a, a tiny town because in my breakout room we were discussing about transport options when you're not in a big city and i come from goa and go are the uh, private the taxi service is a mafia so they you know they charge you atrocious rates for even 1 km which you know is unaffordable if you don't come from a privileged background so what are your options and uh, really all i can tell you is vote vote for the right people uh, start becoming politically active and demand accountability from your stakeholders because you're talking about a situation where you may not have options for transport you may not have connectivity with your internet and you're really um, losing out on several opportunities and honestly if you have access uh, to the internet you can also educate yourself on the best practices that are there not only in keeping yourself safe but about other things that are happening and then 
we've tried to showcase to you the various initiatives happening within India, right from cycling to footpaths to uh, women uh, bike rides to women taxi services to even mass transportation like Kochi Rail and Western Railway so that you can think about how to bring that to your own um, city, village, town. It's not going to be easy and it won't happen overnight, but these are ideas for you to work on, uh, to mobilize your communities, to start getting them to think about these issues. If at the end of the day, we want to live in, uh, you know, by 2030, we're supposed to achieve the sustainable development goals. But if we are, we are not even um, thinking about them, how are we even talking about action? So I think we've completely run out of time right now. This has been a fascinating discussion. What I'm taking from here is uh, you need more women in leadership, like Arti said and several others said, because if you don't have women in leadership, they are not designing policies, systems, um, solutions that work for 50% of the population. Second is there are many different kinds of women across the economic strata. You need different mobility solutions for them. Segregation or non-segregation, it really is a matter of privilege at the, uh, you know, in different contexts. And at the end of the day, policy needs to include the needs of the people. You can't have a standardized policy like the transgender folk. You know, you have to have some relaxation. You have to be flexible. And finally, if you don't have data, you can't measure it. So we have to start collecting the data so that we can think about these uh, issues more broadly and also from a local context, because India, like Satya just said, even within Bangalore, it's so different from the rest of Bangalore. So we have to think about all these things. So thank you everyone for sticking around. I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm going to hang around for another 10, 15 minutes if you want to chat and share. The Padlet is still.